We are just about 100 days out from the midterms. And if history has taught us anything, Democrats should expect to have a long night. But in light of recent events in Washington, like the Supreme Court's reversal of Roe, we're starting to see signs that the political momentum around the country has shifted. Take Kansas, which we just talked about in the last segment. Voter registrations there surged 1,000 percent on the day Roe was overturned. That motivating reminder of what Republican governance looks like, coupled with the Biden administration stringing together a pair of victories on a climate and tax deal, well, as well as six weeks of falling gas prices, it's paving the way for Democrats to potentially maintain control of the Senate. In fact, now, for the first time, polling indicates that Democrats have a favorable chance of holding the Senate. 35 Senate seats are up for grabs in November, 14 Democrat controlled and 21 occupied by Republicans. Of those 35 races, the Cook Political Report is labeling five as toss ups. And Republicans aren't doing themselves any favors in a number of those toss up races, picking some of the least qualified candidates in recent memory. In Pennsylvania, there's the former TV doctor, Mehmet Oz. His race is starting to lean towards Democrat John Fetterman as the lieutenant governor continues to hammer Oz on his ties to New Jersey. And in Georgia, former football star Herschel Walker seems to be fumbling his chances every time he opens his mouth, losing ground recently to incumbent Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock. It's all setting up for an intriguing race to the finish line with just over 100 days to go. Joining me now is Democratic strategist Adam Parkamenko. Adam, my friend, thank you so much for joining us today. I poke fun, admittedly. Yes. So I poke fun, admittedly, Adam, at some of these horribly qualified GOP Senate candidates. But it's a theme that holds true among a lot of them running for all sorts of elected positions. And even if the Dems hold the Senate, it still may bring some Trump apologists into office. Philip Bump on The Washington Post noted that 100 candidates won primaries while explicitly advocating the exact dishonest claims that Trump used to spur on the Capitol riot. If enough of those people win their races, Adam, where is that going to leave us as a country? Well, I think it's a good question. But, you know, for a long time, many of us have thought Trumpism is here to stay. However, I think that, you know, we've seen a number of people who are just tuning in and getting involved for the first time, one of which, you know, Mary Trump has talked recently about her daughter, who was uh, born shortly after September 11th, is somebody who's not political. But after what's happened with the Supreme Court this year, they've gotten involved for the first time. And so if you look, you know, no further than uh, I'm in Virginia here to Maryland, um, you saw in the primary that the Democratic Governors Association actually spent money in favor of the individual who's endorsed by Trump because they think that a number of people are going to reject reject Trumpism in November. So I think if you look at a governor's race such as, you know, Maryland and Massachusetts, Democrats have a huge chance to flip these seats and gain some seats. But also, I think people are so done. I mean, Madison Cawthorn lost his primary, um, you know, basically attaching himself at the hip to Donald Trump and what is Trumpism. Um, so while it may be here to stay, I think that a number of individuals are ultimately going to lose in November because they've attached themselves at the hip to them. So, Adam, I can't move on, though, without asking you and kind of pushing back a little bit to talk a little bit more about this theory of actually as a Democrat actively promoting, if not encouraging or giving money towards a pro-Trump or Trump-supported candidate in a Republican primary. Isn't there a fear that that's going to ultimately backfire? Yeah, I mean, I think it's very counter to conventional wisdom. It's not something that you would like to see, you know, critical, important dollars spent. However, um, I I think they've done it methodically and they've done it very carefully. And in in a place like Maryland, where, you know, you've had a a somewhat moderate but still Republican um, uh, governor for a long time, um, it, it seems to be paying dividends. The governor of Maryland, who is a Republican, currently has already come out and said that he will not endorse Uh, the Republican nominee in Maryland. So it's not happening all over the place, but I think that if it's done in the right way, it'll pay huge dividends in November. So, Adam, you're in Virginia. You are in very close proximity to Washington. Are you hearing and are you expecting any tangible fallout from those January 6th committee hearings and any impact that the candidates that are running on that big lie, you think it's going to actually have a negative impact on their campaigns? 
I think it's a great question. You know, um, uh, to be straightforward, I think there are a number of uh, folks who said there were independents throughout the country who uh, didn't believe or weren't sure that Donald Trump had the involvement that he did on January 6th. Um, and, and January 6th committee has obviously been a way to shine light on those. Sometimes, you know, when they're happening during prime time, we believe um, that will do more. But I think at the end of the day, it, it will have an impact. I think they're doing an incredible job. If you look at someone like Elaine Loria, you know, who um, has not only been elected twice now, but uh, while the second election should have been the hardest of her lifetime, the third is still tough. I think it, 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 it's putting on full display uh, a number of individuals who are in these critical races. And uh, we sort of wound up in this spot um, in, in, and have this committee uh, that's doing great work because McCarthy actually didn't put these kind of nutcase Republicans on the committee that he could have. And I think what we're seeing with the January 6th committee is what we wish we saw more in Congress, which is a committee that's trying to get to the bottom of the truth. So, Adam, you've got your finger on the pulse of so many key races. But what are I'd like you to share with us? What are the key Senate races that you are keeping your eye on specifically ahead of the elections? What are the absolute must wins for Democrats if they're going to try to hold on to that chamber? I think there's some key races. I think we need, you know, Mark Kelly in Arizona. We've got to hold that race. Um, you know, in Georgia, I think we've, we've got a number of uh, uh, quote unquote celebrities on the Republican side that are running where we've got Democrats that are sort of becoming celebrities in their own right because they're they're running uh, to be civil servants. Right. So we've got John Fetterman, um, uh, who's key. Um, and I think that's a seat that we could flip. I think Wisconsin, once we have a nominee there, um, could be another seat that we could flip. I think we could pick up at least two, but it'd be, it'd be critical if we could hold Georgia, Nevada, Arizona, and New Hampshire. Um, and they're all looking great. And there's a new poll out today that shows uh, Fetterman's doing a great job. And that's also another um, uh, governor's seat in Pennsylvania that I think we can hold because you literally have somebody uh, running on the Republican side for governor in Pennsylvania who attended the January 6th insurrection. And he's not the only one, right, Adam? He's not the uh, he's not an outlier for that insanity. No. Quickly, before I have to let you go, Adam, I asked this question to several Democratic strategists because I I want to know the answer. Um, do you think Democrats are prepared to be one issue voters? The Republicans have kind of cornered the market on that. In fact, I've always maintained a lot of conservatives kind of evangelical said, you know, what? I'll hold my nose with Donald Trump because I want him to stack that Supreme Court with conservative justices to get Roe overturned. He apparently delivered. Right. Do you think Democrats, though, are prepared, the Gen Zers, for example, to look at the overturning of Roe v. Wade and say that's enough? That one issue is totally enough for me to go and vote in November and make sure a Democrat wins that seat. You know, I don't know the uh, uh, the perfect answer to that. What I do know, though, is, you know, at, at the end of the day, no matter what happens in the future, this still is a two party system. I think Gen Z has showed um, incredible strength this week, hitting back against Matt Gates, raising funds for just an enormous amount of organizations throughout the country. And I think at the end of the day, people are willing to put aside certain issues to make sure that they're getting the right individuals in office. And, uh, you know, uh, come November, we'll see. But I think that the Democratic Party has always been a huge tent. And uh, uh, with their help, especially Gen Z, I think that we can keep the House expanded. But not only that, but make sure we have the votes to do what we need to do in the Senate and have a really strong final two years of the Biden administration. Well, the point of the Democratic Party is exactly what you said. It's the big tent party. There's space for everybody. Adam Parkamango, thanks so much for being here today. We appreciate you. Thank you.